Those who fought World War II are often referred to as the greatest generation. And this movie we're about to talk to is evidence that that label is certainly true from a carrier aviation standpoint. This movie was released in 1944. At that time, there was still about a year and a half left before the end of the war in both theaters, and victory was not assured. So 20th Century Fox, in cooperation with the U.S. Navy, produced this movie to be shown in hometowns nationwide to calm the nerves of the home front and convince Americans that the war was being won. This movie is also arguably the best portrayal of what a deployment was like. Because this movie involved actual service members and real Navy ships and airplanes, and has real combat footage, gun cameras, and other stuff shot aboard the aircraft carriers at sea in hostile waters, there was great concern about operational security. So they don't name the carrier, and in some cases they don't identify where the scenes are happening. However, the title of the movie, The Fighting Lady, is the nickname for the USS Yorktown, and in fact, most of the filming was done aboard the Yorktown. So you see here, right from the outset, this production is a hybrid. It's labeled as a news drama, part newsreel, part drama. It's not really a drama in that it involves actual Navy personnel and uses real combat footage. And in that way, it is the purest, most accurate, and quite frankly, badass carrier aviation movie ever. In the credits, you see a lot of the people involved hold Navy rank, including the narrator, Navy Reserve Lieutenant Robert Taylor. He is Hollywood royalty. He had a long career in Hollywood, starting with a contract he signed in the 30s with MGM. He was in an early naval aviation movie called Flight Command that came out in 1940 before we were drawn into the war. And his voice is pitch perfect as you hear at the outset. Far aloft over the Atlantic seaboard one fine morning in 1943, an imposing force of American naval air power proceeds to an important rendezvous. This force is the aircraft complement of a new carrier. Fighters, dive bombers, torpedo bombers. With the air group commander leading everyone, they are flying out to sea to join the ship which will be their floating home and fighting base. He mentions three types of airplanes there. Fighters, which is the Hellcat, the F6F, made by Grumman, my favorite aircraft company, because they built the F-14 Tomcat, of course. Torpedo bombers, the Avenger, and dive bombers, the Dauntless. And here we get our first look at this new carrier, the Essex class. This is the USS Yorktown, nicknamed the Fighting Lady. Never identified as the Yorktown in the movie, again, because of operational security. Here we get our first look at an airplane coming aboard. And you can see behind him three other airplanes coming into the pattern. That's a great bit of footage there. This is a TBM landing. Here's our first look at the LSO. Back in the 1940s, there was no such thing as a Fresnel lens to assist pilots with glide slope. There was only an LSO. And we call LSOs paddles these days because back in the 40s, they actually, as you can see, used paddles. So let's just note at this point that this cutting edge brand new aircraft carrier in 1944 is a straight deck aircraft carrier. That's different than modern aircraft carriers that we've talked about on the channel before in that Nimitz class, just like since Forrestal class, have angled decks, which is designed to accommodate the idea that if you miss the wires, you can go around and try again. And as a result of that, what modern pilots do, as we've described in the Carrier Ops episode of the channel, when they land, they go to full power. So if they miss the wires, that's called a bolter, and they go around and try it again. Also, these LSOs are more directly guiding the pilots to landing, and you see they're using paddles. And that's where the label for LSOs that's used to this day, paddles, comes from. The other thing is different you will see the LSO give the pilot a cut signal with one paddle as they cross the ramp, meaning pull the power back to idle. So unlike today where 
when pilots touch down, they go to full power. Back in World War II, they pulled the power, cut the engines, and rolled into the wires. So here you see this guy coming aboard, this TBM coming aboard, catches a wire, no problem. Here we see paddles. There's a wave off, literally a wave off. Guy takes it around. There's your cut. Wing just comes over his head. This guy's lined up way left, but he succeeds in catching a wire. As a modern day, let's just call it carrier aviator, these kind of flight ops kind of blow my mind. Here we see the carrier CO. They just call him Jocko, again, OPSEC. They mentioned that he's a graduate of the class of 1917, which makes him at this point a 27-year veteran of the U.S. Navy. And that's about right for a senior captain. You see they have some footage of him guiding flight deck personnel on how to park airplanes. And right away you get the tone that, you know, Jocko and everybody else is, is training this green crew for war ops. The thing about going on deployment in 1944 is you know you're going to see some action. The five deployments I did over my career, there was never certainty as we left port that we would be sailing into harm's way. Sometimes we did episodically. Contingency ops, the war in Bosnia in 95-96, Operation Southern Watch sometimes got sporty. But the degree to which this crew knew they were going into harm's way is remarkable. Again, the claim that this is the greatest generation is valid. So as they're doing these, let's just call them workups, the rigor and the intensity is great. You see this as Jocko is directing his flight deck crew how to park airplanes. And certainly as they start to do gunnery training, they have to take it very seriously. You see here, the Fighting Lady presents the Essex class as a miracle of modern warfare. They have this long footage of the hangar bay. During this time, this was quite a miracle of modern naval architecture. And then they do gunnery training. Again, because they know they're going in harm's way, they will certainly weather Japanese aircraft attacks. They take this training very seriously. It's going to matter as they go forward. The other thing you'll note is the armament of this classic carrier is very substantial. Modern aircraft carriers have some in-close weapon systems and other ways to protect it. At the end game, if somebody sneaks through the gauntlet of picket ships and airplanes that are designed to protect the carrier, but this kind of firepower does not exist on Nimitz or Ford class carriers. So we get through workups and we start to sail west. You get some scenes of life on the ship. Here the pilots are in the wardroom kicking back. There's a little bit of steel beach action, sunbathing on the flight deck. And then the ship goes through the Panama Canal, and it barely fits. Just narrow enough to make it through the Panama Canal. And we head to the open waters of the Pacific. The crew starts to wonder, where are we going? There's a cameo here of Vice Admiral Mark Mitcher. There's a building at the Naval Academy named for him, who is the task force commander and they're starting to do their war plans. So the narrator mentions that although the crew doesn't know where they're going, Admiral Mitcher does. The other guys who know where they're going are the ship's captain and the air wing commander. So the first strike is going to go against a very tiny triangle-shaped island called Marcus Island. You see here CAG using a plotter to figure out ranges. Very old school strike warfare planning. Okay, here's the strike brief. Intel pointing out the targets on Marcus Island. There's Marcus Island, literally a triangle. And here's training aids, just happens to be the guy's hands. He's talking about best practices for shooting zeros. At this point in the deployment, there are a lot of aviators who have never seen combat just like there are a bunch of crew members who've never seen combat. Experience is the best teacher and they're gonna learn that way. What you see over the course of this movie, they get substantial warfighting experience in a hurry. You see the aviators getting dressed in the ready room, wiping off his goggles there. 
So they wear their khakis. They didn't have flight suits. They'd wear flight gear over their khakis, cloth flight helmets. I'm assuming Smitty's real name is Smith. Refer to our call sign episode for that one, where that fits in the call sign hierarchy. It's time to man up the airplanes. Pilots, man your planes. Ready room three, roger. Pilots, man your planes. There's a mad dash. I'm not sure what this guy is handing out here, smoking a cigarette. Last minute instructions. So just like recoveries are different now, launches were different then. There are no catapults. You deck run. And that's why all the airplanes are staged on the aft end of the carrier and the rest of that real estate is used for deck runs. So we see here the footage of a couple of Avengers taking off. And then here's a Dauntless that's pretty heavily weighed down and the guy actually immediately raises the gear and gets airborne. So he's got a lot of ordnance there, which he's gonna use. So they reach Marcus Island and we get our first look at some gun camera footage. So you see the tracers going down. You also see tracers coming back up at the airplane. There's a lot of AAA anti-aircraft fire coming up at these airplanes as they strafe Marcus Island. You see the camera shaking because of the vibration when the gun fires. Just amazing footage. After they're done attacking the island, they also take out some shipping. On their way out, they do some battle damage assessment. It looks like mission was accomplished. Okay, back aboard the ship. Paddles with some body language, boots some rudder, and wave it off. He's not liking what he's seeing, so this TBM takes it around. And cut your engine, and he's aboard. This flight deck handler gets some style points for the way that he directs the airplane. And then they go and debrief Civic. See, this, this pilot is looking at a photo of the island and describing pretty literally how he swept over the island. Meanwhile, more airplanes are coming aboard. This guy's smoking his tires, misses the wires. LSOs are wearing boxers. See here, if you miss the wires, you're gonna hit this last ditch kind of low hanging barricade and uh, the airplane's gonna tip nose down and that will damage the props. So that initial Marcus Island strike, they cut their teeth, success, no real opposition in terms of air to air. There was some AAA as we described. They've had a taste of combat. So the Marcus Island campaign actually took place in late 1943. Now it's early 1944 and they're directed to do a strike against Kwajalein. Now this is their first taste of air-to-air -air warfare. You see some awesome gun camera footage here. So by this point the Hellcat is a better fighter than the Wildcat was but there's also a lot of learnings that have been passed along to the newer pilots about how to fight the Zero. And you can see in this footage, they're very effective. The machine guns are at the leading edge of the wing on either side. The bullets cross at 300 yards, and that's the sight picture that they're trying to obtain. You can see when they're being effective, those bullets are meeting at the bandit. Some interesting strafing footage. They get very low, to put it mildly, taking out these seaplanes that are stationed at Kwajalein. These guys are down there in the weeds. And, and remember, they're getting shot at when they're doing this and they're getting right down there close to take out the targets. So they have great success at Kwajalein. They can see that the Marines are landing as they are on their way back to the carrier. Hopefully they've softened up the beach enough to make the amphibious landing a success. And now, even as they're on their way back, Admiral Mitcher gets word that they need to start planning other strikes against Truck Island. They believe, based on intel, the Japanese task force is actually currently located there. So get the airplanes back aboard. We meet Smokey, who is an aviator who's been tasked with coordinating with the strike packages from the ship. And the narrator mentions that Smokey would rather be flying like all pilots, and that's certainly true. But he has a very important role to relay between 
the airplanes and the staff what's going on. So here's a look at Truck Islands. It's an atoll surrounded by coral reefs, which makes it a very effective logistics base for the Japanese. Some more great footage of Avengers taking off. Again, the deck run. Now they roll in on truck. Here the pilot is taking out a, a larger observation airplane. More gun camera footage of zeros. High to low kill, airplane on fire. This is pretty amazing strafing footage. The other airplanes are kind of in the field of view. It looks to be a little bit close to me, but I guess these guys by this point know what they're doing. Strafing airplanes on the ground. Again, look how low they get. This guy can almost land. The thing you gotta watch out for are the ricochets. You could shoot yourself down. Here's some dauntless footage. You can see the bombs going off. These are not the bombs. When you see a bomb explode, it's not from the airplane who's shooting this footage. It's from one of his wingmen. So you see a hit there. You see the shadow of another airplane. There's another hit. None of those bombs are from the airplane that is taking this footage. He drops his bombs and pulls off. His bombs hit behind him as he's pulling up. Now, an interesting side note is Pappy Boynton of Baba Black Sheep fame was actually being held as prisoner aboard truck when the strike happened. The first time he saw this movie, he said, hey, I'm, you can actually see where I was hiding during the strike in some of this footage. And as they did at Marcus Island, they're also taking out some shipping. Now, they're disappointed that the Japanese task force was actually not located at Truck Island, as they had anticipated it would be. But there was some shipping traffic that they were able to take out. And here you see the secondaries are pretty substantial. Right there. So the airplane's coming back because they've been shot up in some cases. You can see that there are uh, mishaps aboard the carrier. Here's CAG. He's, he's been shot in the face. And so his cockpit is completely covered with blood. He survives to, to fly another day, but he has a you know, pretty significant facial wound here from a, a, a stray round. Airplane missing the landing gear comes aboard, stops successfully. Here's a TBM that uh, smashes into the island. Now, after the Truck Island campaign, they're headed for a mystery anchorage. They won't identify what it is again because of OPSEC, but now they're joining up with other Essex-class carriers, as well as some escort carriers, smaller carriers. You can see uh, here's one here shaped uh, much differently than the fleet carriers. So they did the Marcus Island, they did the truck campaign, and now they're consolidating with a task force to do something much bigger. But in the meantime, they're able to have some swim call. See this guy does this beautiful swan dive. They have time for mail call. There are sensors that QA letters to make sure there's no violation of operational security, even innocently. So every letter is read on the way out and on the way in. And most of the sailors knew that that was going to happen, so they sanitized their letters, let's just say it accordingly. Jocko is no longer the captain. He's been promoted to admiral. So they have a new CO. His name is Dixie. And he gives kind of a morale-building speech to everybody. He says, I can't tell you exactly where we're going, but let's just say our destination is Tokyo. And that causes the crew to give a big cheer so they know that they're in for something pretty huge. The task force sails to the northwest. Along the way, they're discovered by a lumbering Japanese observation airplane. So they wind up shooting this airplane down, but they know that before the airplane was taken out, they transmitted the task force's presence. So now they're at heightened state of alert and they're ready for anything. So they're headed for the Marianas Islands, and they're going to do a strike against the island of Tinian, which is a Japanese stronghold. Before the strike, they make a huge, what they call a battle breakfast, steak and eggs, quintessentially American meal. So the pilots get fueled up, but before they can launch the strike, the Japanese get the jump on them. So you can see as this footage goes along, it's sunrise, and it gets lighter and lighter. But all these tracers shot down that airplane right there, crew celebrating. The task force is able to ward off this attack. They shoot down 19 
Japanese airplanes and lose zero ships. So that's a real big win for the Americans. So now they get ready to launch the, the strikes against Tinian, manning up the airplanes. That is a very legendary beard. That's a great look right there. Motors are primed by physically moving the propellers. You can see all the airplanes turning here on the fantail. They start to launch. Fighters go first, followed by the bombers. Wings unfold, lock into place, and then they start their deck run. There's a Hellcat, Avenger, and they're on their way. So again, some fantastic gun camera footage with the strike on Tinian, strafing airplanes on the ramp and dropping bombs on targets that had been assigned. Again, I'm blown away by how low they get on these strafing runs. That strike is complete and is now becoming commonplace. The airplanes returned, many of them very damaged. Guy lost most of one of his horizontal stabs. There's an airplane on fire. Pretty rudimentary firefighting capabilities in these days. Not a lot of the chemicals that we have now. A lot of it's just seawater. But the damage control teams show a lot of bravery and a lot of skill using what they have. Again, Paddles is in his boxers, waving the airplanes as they come aboard. Here is an airplane that was unable to drop incendiary device, and now it's lit off on the flight deck. This is a bad situation. But the courage of the damage control team, the firefighters, takes care of it. You can see this; these fire extinguishers are ineffective in the wind. They take a hose to it and clear the uh, phosphorus out from under the airplane, averting disaster in the process. Debrief the strike, battle damage assessment, the intel officers getting the big picture, reporting it to the Admiral. No sooner are they doing a little post-mission letdown when they have to go to general quarters again because there is now a Japanese attack on the task force. During general quarters, even the mascot puts on a life preserver. You see, it's a very intense attack on the task force. This footage right here is amazing. A torpedo bomber that's making it through a hail of bullets. Fortunately, either because the pilot's dead or the weapon is hung, does not deliver the torpedo and winds up crashing in the ocean. So now fight is on once and for all. This will be the Battle of Philippine Sea. Launch the strike package. Smokey gets the nod to man up an airplane, for which he's very happy. See here the enlisted gunners in the, in the dungarees. You see that the flight deck is an equally dangerous place to work then as it is now. Prop blast is substantial. Here we see a couple of Avengers deck running for the strike. So the Japanese send up their fighters to engage our strike package as it approaches their task force. And what results is what is now known as the Marianas Turkey Shoot. The final tally is 369 Japanese airplanes shot down to American losses of only 22. So fighters are knocked down, so now it's time to take out the Japanese task force. This footage is mostly from Dauntless dive bombers. Some fighters who still have ordnance available can also be involved in the strafing mission. You can see the wakes of the Japanese task force. They're driving back and forth trying to avoid the attack of the U.S. Navy bombers. The other thing you'll notice is when the bombers are strafing the surface combatants, they aim for the bridge, assuming that the captain and the other ship's leadership is there. And in this final footage, you see the juiciest target, which is a Japanese aircraft carrier that they wind up sinking. In fact, the Battle of the Philippine Sea is the death knell for the Japanese carrier fleet. After this battle, the Japanese don't allow their aircraft carriers to leave port again. The Marianas Turkey shoot was an overwhelming victory. However, a number of airplanes did get shot up. That Avenger actually flamed out before he could reach the ship and wound up flipping over. This Wildcat can't get his gear down, does a belly landing and smashes into the island and narrowly missing that crash crew guy. And airplanes that aren't salvageable just get thrown overboard. And this last bit of footage here, the pilot has basically no control of this airplane. 
and he winds up completely demolishing it against the island. Luckily, the cockpit is intact and he walks away. So the crew tallies up the victories, paints the island. The numbers are impressive. Pilots paint kill markings on their airplanes. But there's also an American toll of casualties. And Smokey, who so badly wanted a mission and got one, is missing, presumed KIA. The Marines do a 21-gun salute in memorial, and I'll let our narrator, Robert Taylor, have the final word. Others will come forward to take their places. For the battles we have fought on the seas and in the sky are only the beginning. Still hungry for battle will steam our carrier, serene, powerful, unafraid. She and her planes will come home again someday, God grant, but not until the bitter, glorious end. For she is, and we salute her, the Fighting Lady. Robert Taylor died relatively young. He was a three-pack-a-day smoker, died at the age of 59 in the early 60s. This movie, Fighting Lady, won the Academy Award for Best Documentary Film at the Oscars in 1945, hosted by Bob Hope. And it was the first Academy Awards to be broadcast on the radio. This is before TV in its entirety. So as I said, for my money, the Fighting Lady is the purest and most badass carrier aviation film ever. Now, the aircraft carrier featured in The Fighting Lady, the USS Yorktown, is a museum in Charleston, South Carolina, that is open to the public. And in fact, they actually have an F-14 on display on the flight deck, which reminds me of the final countdown and that it's World War II meets the Tomcat. I highly recommend visiting Yorktown if you're in the area. All right, that'll do it for this episode. If you're a first-time viewer, please... Ring the bell and become a subscriber. Give me the likes. Comment. I love comments and I try to engage as much as I can. And if you'd like to help us take it to the next level, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarol. Also, check the links below for our t-shirts and also for where you can get Punk's War, my debut novel. And I look forward to talking to you again soon.